Hello again, everybody. This is James Bartley, and you're watching and listening to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Today, my very special guest is Jenny Constantine, a.k.a. Jennifer Constantine, a well-known tarot reader, mystic, spiritual warrior, my lab, if I may be so bold as to call her a my lab, based on some of her experiences, and a dear friend of mine. And it's been a blessing to have Jenny come into my life because I've learned so much from her in a relatively short period of time. We have a lot of things in common as far as insight, as far as similarity of some of the experiences, and we've only had a few discussions, and I, I know there's so much more there, uh, so many more similarities. Uh, Jenny's website is jennymoonstone.com, and she's also an accomplished tarot reader, and I'd like her you know, to talk about some of her tarot reading work, too, because it's important that we get insight from the right sources. <laughs> There's so many people out there that, you know, make make themselves out to be gurus and, and self-appointed uh, all-knowing masters, but it's good to know that there are people out there that are heart-centered. So without any further ado, Jennifer Constantine, welcome to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me, James. This is so much fun for me. Um, and, you know, you're totally right, you know, with when I first um, started talking to you, there was an instant sense of familiarity. Um, and we find that that happens from time to time in this community. Anybody that is naturally drawn to the subject, uh, the subjects that we discuss, we, we have these, these common threads. We always have so much in common and we just recognize these, uh, these connections within one another. So, um, it's been great getting to know you and it's, it's so exciting all that we have uh, to, you know, all the content we're going to create in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, please excuse my, my raspiness. I am getting over my first ever case of laryngitis. Never, never lost my voice this long before and I'm so happy it's finally coming back. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm totally ready to, to dive in and, and get into some really weird stuff with, with your audience today. <laughs> For the benefit of our listeners, Jennifer, tell us a bit about your background and this process of, of awakening for you and the different milestones in your life that led you to this point. Sure. Thank you. I'd be happy to. So I was born in uh, 1989, March of 1989, um, in Panama, Central America, on a military base uh, during wartime. So 1989, Noriega, uh, there, was, there was a huge conflict. Forgive me if I, I should really remember the, the name of the operation, um, but it was a, it's a very well-known operation. The Marines came in. It was a big old mess. Um, so about nine days after my birth, my mother, my brother, and myself were evacuated out of Panama City um, on Air Force One to Kingston, Jamaica, which is where we lived after that for about three years, while my father stayed behind temporarily in Panama uh, to, to continue whatever work he was doing there. Um, so my father has worked for many years, most of his life really, um, for the State Department, for the CIA, um, and he has just quite a, um, quite a rapport with, with the government. You know, he's given them many, many good years. And, um, you know, I, it's, it's an interesting point of conflict that, that I have with my father right now. He's a, he's a good man. I, I, we, we kind of get, we get along, even though we have so many differences of, of our worldviews. Um, so, you know, I was, I was born into a world that um, it was sort of, it was all there. Uh, it was all um, mapped out. And as this strange, you know, newcomer in this world, it, my struggle was really finding out my place in it because I never fit the mold they they wanted me to uh, be, be one of them okay so when i say one of them um, my father is a proud democrat he is also a zionist um, he's worked in washington dc for for many years we lived in fairfax county um, for about six or seven years when my father worked in washington dc um, at the uh, at various agencies okay i've been to CIA headquarters. He worked at the Pentagon as well, um, as well as the State Department. He worked directly for Hillary Clinton's State Department in the 90s. Um, 
which at the time, it all seemed very normal to me. I was just a kid growing up in the 90s. So um, I didn't, you know, it's only in retrospect, do I notice a lot of this stuff is very uh, unkosher, as I'd like to, as I'd like to say it. Um, so, you know, my life has been riddled with mystery. It's been riddled with all kinds of strange occurrences. I think that this is something that a lot of people that are born into government or military families can attest to. There are um, people that come in and they take interest in the parents and the children. They enroll children in what are known as enrichment classes, of which I was recruited for or a part of for four years. And so, you know, it, it all seemed normal. That was my life. That was my existence. And things really began to change for me um, when I actually became pregnant. My first pregnancy, I was 18 years old. And it, it, the, the, the fluidity and, and the rapid nature um, with which a lot of what I'll call memories and data started to flood to the surface was what really made me hit the brakes with everything and say, no, I, I need to sit down with my timeline. I need to sit down and go over everything that has happened that I can recall and try to make sense of it. Now, the making sense of it part, I'm still in that. I'm still very much learning, okay? I don't have all the answers. It's part of the reason why we do what we're doing now is to network with other people that have similar experiences and backgrounds so that we can compare notes, we can get unbiased and, and otherwise neutral perspectives of our story. So, you know, and, and I tell people all the time, if, if you were born into this and you have these kinds of experiences, if you have not seriously questioned your sanity on a daily basis for, for, for a period of time, you're not really, you're not really breaking the surface because the level of intricacy, the level of weirdness associated with this world, it will test you each and every day where you're like, this is crazy. I am insane. I am crazy. I'm making this up. This isn't real. I need help. So I, you know, and I talk to a lot of people and I say, listen, you might be crazy, but you might not be. Okay, so let's talk about this. And, and that's why the work that we do here is so important for us. It's important for people that are listening, that are coming into this information to let you guys know that you're not alone. Um, while this isn't the most common story of all, it, it is quite common. And there is very much an underbelly, uh, a network, a system that runs directly parallel to the surface world that for some reason or another, we have been subjected to. We've been given uh, glimpses. We've peered through it. And now we try to make sense of it and, and share it with the rest of the world. Um, I have been subjected to every pharmaceutical drug, uh, namely SSRIs, antidepressants, and antipsychotics from the time that I was 13 years old. Um, I was intermittently um, institutionalized in various mental health organizations right here in South Florida, and I'm going to get to the issue of South Florida as being uh, what we will call the quote, quote unquote the swamp of the DNC. We all hear um, the, this terminology thrown around a lot, drain the swamp. Well, I happen to believe that DC is one of the uh, you know, one of the locations of the swamp. South Florida is yet another. Silicon Valley is yet another. The Vatican City is yet another. Um, which, by the way, not only did I live in D.C. Uh, with my parents for about six or seven years, but I also, my father was given an assignment at the American Embassy in Rome, Italy, as the regional security officer um, of, of the U.S. Embassy there. And my school was right around the corner from Vatican City. So I, we had many, many field trips, lots of masses with the robes and the dress and the, you know, all the fodder. So I was exposed to this very strange cult-like world that at the time I thought this was just life. I thought this was normal. All of my peers were all in on it and everything was, you know, everything was relatively normal. Um, 
until I reached a certain age and I realized this isn't normal. Um, so I, I think I'll, what some of your audience might be able to relate to me with it is if anybody has ever been raised in any kind of fundamental religious um, community or family, there's a similar kind of breaking point that an individual undergoes when they reach a certain age or they are ejected from the community, even if it's just temporarily, they see, oh my God, this is the real world and I've been living in a bubble. So the process of finding it all out has been riddled with all kinds of disinformation. I've been um, intercepted and interfered with by all kinds of people that I feel were there to completely derail me, derail my research, derail my, my, um, my relearning, my remembering of things. And so I think a lot of people can also attest to this kind of, this kind of labyrinth. You try to start to come out of it and you start to make sense of things. There's obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. And so that's why doing what we're doing now, it's a huge help. Um, it's, a, it's a form of, of uh, comfort as well as support. We really can't do this alone. Um, so, and you know, it really is a wonder that I have mind at all to be able to recall what I do and to speak on things um, because of the massive amounts of antipsychotics, antidepressants, and SSRIs that I was given. Um, from the ages of 13 to 17 while I was intermittently institutionalized here in South Florida. Um, in my parents' defense, and I know people think that's weird, why would I defend them? Because I really think that they, do, they didn't know better. Um, I think that they did the best that they could given their frame of mind. Um, and so I was very much given over to the county, to, to Broward County, and my mental health my physical, my medical uh, care was all uh, government options, okay? When you're the child of a diplomat or the child of a military, uh, military personnel, all of your health care, whether it's mental health or physical health, it is all government sanctioned. It is all run by them. So it was really just an easy way for them to have complete access to me around the clock, okay? I, I'm not talking about you know, a couple nights in, in some institution. I'm talking about, I did a year at a location in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Georgia that has since been shut down for child abuse. Um, I did over a month at a place here called University Pavilion, where I, most of my days were on the other side of a double-sided mirror, just being observed. Now, I think what differs a little bit from my story is that I don't recall ever being uh, brutalized at the hands of any staff. I actually was given, um, you know, they, they paid such close attention to me. And I'm not saying that they did everything right. I mean, I suffered because of the drugs they gave me. But it was very much a give her this, do this, and do that. And now let's just sit back and observe. Okay, so I was observed for years. And, um, you know, it, it was hard because I became a mother very young and that really pushed my entire system, my physical system, my emotional body, my spiritual body into a kind of boot camp where I needed to get a hold of things really quickly. There was no, you know, I needed to figure things out really fast because I became a mother and I needed to protect my children. The, the instinct to protect my, my three children now from what I was subjected to as a child is what drives me each and every day. Um, and so that's another reason why I'm so, I advocate so strongly for children and I, I'm so heavily anti-human trafficking, anti-child trafficking, because I know firsthand the, um, the interest the massive interest invested in by the military and the government in youngsters, in gifted youngsters. So, um, you know, I, I hope that that's just a little something for your, your audience to chew on. I know people are like, well, you know, who, who does he or she think she is talking about this stuff and what gives them, you know, the audacity to come out and say that I know something that you don't. And it's like, well, 
I was born into it. I, I, I took my hits, you know, I've done the time I suffered. Um, and I, I came out, I'm okay. I'm all right. So I, I use that as a means to fight back my victory. The fact that I'm alive and coherent and not drooling and thought, you know, not, I don't have all of these horrible side effects from the various drugs they gave me. I consider that a miracle and I would never consider wasting it by keeping silent or not talking about it or saying that's a part of my life. I'm going to lock it away, not talk about it. No, I'm going to talk about it because it continues to happen to, to people uh, all over, all over the place. So um, I, yeah, that's, that's, I think that's a good place to start. Thank you for sharing that, Jenny. I've heard similar, excuse me, folks, I've got the frog syndrome with my voice too. So every once in a while, I may sound somewhat croaky. I've heard of similar school programs, the magnet program. And typically what happens is some military type will come along to uh, the young parents of some really bright, sharp kid with an interesting DNA profile and go, he or she is so bright. What we'll do is, if it's okay with you, we'll you know, take your, your child from their regular school oh, for about three, four, five, six hours a day. It'll vary. And we'll take them to this other special school where other special kids are because your kid is so special. And so this, the egos of the parents are being stroked. Oh, we've got a special kid and they're part of this enrichment magnet program. They have no idea what it entails and what happens to these kids when they're you know, taken away like this. And, and other things that you said, uh, Jennifer, that really struck home with me was also the fact that when you're born into this kind of culture, you don't know any better. And your medical care, everything is, is provided for you by, by the system. So in your case, and in, and in the case of many others, Jennifer, I, I see it in a way as kind of an incarnational infiltration. At Oversoul, higher self level, you said, okay, how do I penetrate this matrix? How do I disrupt it from within? How do I get the information? And oh, I think I'll be born to uh, be the daughter of a guy who's a diplomatic security service, a honcho, right? So mm -hmm. that's how I see that developed. Now, the milestones along the way, and it, it may be possible, I'm just guessing here, that as you start to have these flashbacks, you start to have these mystical visions and, and, and experiences, did that kind of tie in with the onset of the psychiatric treatment? I mean, what came first? Was it uh, the memories, the visions, experiences, and then maybe in a way to suppress all that, you know, came the psych psychiatric treatments? How did that develop? Yeah. Well, yeah. So my earliest memories are so, and, and, you know, if we were to do some research on our earliest memories, a lot of scientists will tell you that they all do take on a dream-like quality so that we actually can't, uh, people don't consider memories, especially distant memories from childhood, as any real kind of evidence of anything because the brain is so primal in those years. Um, however, you know, with that being said, my earliest memories were wild. I mean, wild. Um, I remember being the only child at an all adult party. Okay. Again, no, no memories of sexual abuse. Um, in, in that, in that sense, I, I, I don't have any, um, memories of, of pain in that regard. Um, however, I do have memories of, um, going into secret passages inside of mountains on the beach where all of a sudden I'm the only child at, a, at an all adult party. Um, none of this makes any sense, okay? Um, I also, for, for years as a child, it, it tapered off around eight years old. Um, I would see human beings walking around as crystals. So this, is, this was something that I actually loved. It brought me a sense of comfort because I could detect who a person was, how they were feeling based on the, the crystal that they took on. So, you know, and I didn't even, I didn't even tell anybody about it. I did, I just thought, well, like, this is, this is just how it is. And, and I didn't, I didn't tell my mom or dad, oh, mom, dad, that guy's an amethyst or that lady's a smoky quartz or anything like that. It was just how I perceived the world. Um, and so I don't know if that was something that 
was imbued into my system as a result of experimentation or if I was just born with that. I tend to believe, um, you know, and like you, I, I subscribe very much to the idea that there is a very technologically advanced sort of mapping system that is able to predict when a certain soul is going to incarnate. So, you know, they, they know when we're coming in, okay? Um, but that, that also we can't take out the fact that as sovereign souls, we have choices. So I chose to incarnate as the daughter of, you know, this guy and, and be born into this family, but they saw me coming. And so, you know, it's like we clash, we meet head on right here on the battlefield. As soon as we're born, it's like, all right, game on, let's play. Right. Um, but really, you know, when I say things, things changed around eight, uh, because that is the time that we moved to Rome. My father took an assignment at the embassy in Rome, you know, the Vatican and the backdrop and the whole nine. Um, things changed then because I started to feel an extreme uptick uh, in, in experiences. I have strange experiences uh, of, of nighttime visitations, uh, channeling beings, channeling the people that have passed that I have no recollection of. They were told to me by my mother who has no reason to make this stuff up because for years she said, you're not special, get over it. But she would still make, you know, she would still tell me, oh, by the way, you did this, this, and that. Isn't that weird? But when I would tell her, mom, I'm seeing these things and things are happening and I need help, she would say, you're not special, get over it. It's it, so it's all in your head, get over it. So, you know, uh, but, but it's, it, it, what happened was I became more vocal. I became more vocal about what I was feeling and experiencing and it manifested itself in a way that was very problematic to my family. It was problematic to my social world because I wasn't getting, I truly feel I wasn't getting the guidance or support that I really needed um, to hone these abilities uh, to, to talk to people without judgment, my parents didn't really want to hear it. You know, they, they subscribed to the idea that medicine will fix it. The white coats will fix it. Let's give her to them because they're the professionals and they know what to do. Um, sorry about that. Telemarketers. <laughs> you know, they, they, they did the best that they could. They, you know, they believed that what I needed was psychotropic drugs and hours and hours of therapy and talking about it and being observed when I, it just pushed me deeper and deeper into the corners of my mind that things started to really get out of hand. I was hyper, hyper sexual from the time I was about three years old, which is absolutely not normal. Um, I'm still working through that, you know, um, trying to, trying to make sense of all of that. Uh, also my, my psychic abilities just it's when you don't have guidance, when you don't have people around you that understand, or at least to sit down and say, I hear you. I don't understand exactly what, what you mean by this, but I'm with you and I hear you. It, it can manifest itself in some really destructive ways. And so that's how it was for me. And when my parents didn't know how to deal with it, I was then handed over to what I call the white coats that really just made everything so much worse and then I reached you know maturity 18 years old got pregnant very very quickly I you know I fell in love and um, it was starting a new chapter in my life and I was so compelled to chase after some of these fields of study uh, and to what end I didn't know I had no idea where this was gonna go I just felt everything in my in my body everything in my heart say this is something you need to get into. And uh, it, it just, I, I hope that answers your question. It's so easy for you Yes, to... it does, because it, it points out some key milestones in your life and how this burgeoning metaphysical side to you was coming out. And the next thing you know, this matrix rises up. Nope, psychiatric tyranny, here we go, with the treatments and, and with the shrinks and the whole bit. And, We've seen this, sadly, Jenny. I'm sorry. 
bashed into my microphone. You see this sadly with so many gifted kids, intuitive kids. It just like the system is designed to suppress them and get them into this borgified state, if that's a word. Now, one thing that the listener should be aware of is, is besides having had these experiences, besides having survived and overcome the psychiatric tyranny, and besides being the person that she is, she's also Jennifer Constantine, an outstanding field investigator in her own right. And this, you know, it touches me at a very deep level because there's only so many real hardcore investigators around these days, right? A lot of people talk a big game, but they don't, they're not really students of the craft. They don't really get down and dirty and do the field work. You mentioned Broward County as being a hot zone, an epicenter. And I'd like, in the time we got left in the, in the first segment, and towards the end, I'd like you to talk about the first segment about your tarot work too, because it plays a key part of this. The people have to understand, our listeners already know this, Jenny, but a lot of the people that really only get into the surface level stuff, they have to understand at some level that there's an, a linkage between the deep black, non-human, weird science, mystical, occult stuff on the one hand and the outward manifestations of it on the other, which we see in the form of a false flag school shootings, uh, these kind of deep state uh, events that happen on the surface that a lot of surface level researchers are aware of. Take us through the process of, of what you began to see boots on the ground there in Broward County, because to me, with my background studying all the CIA uh, you know, operations there, supporting Castro, trying to kick Castro out, and all the stuff that goes on in the Bahamas, the weird science stuff, the Bermuda Triangle. I mean, they got it all going on over there. There actually has been a deep, deep naval uh, undersea research unit over there. I forget the technical name of it, but they're there based in the Bahamas, and one of their primary roles is monitoring all the ET underwater uh, USO activity, UFO activity. So take our, our listeners to that process, uh, uh, Jenny, where – the surface and the subsurface and the deep space, it all ties in with the human trafficking. It all ties in with the, the, the alien control. Sure, sure. So it's, it's, it's such an expansive topic, um, but there, there really are these bridges. My, my struggle, my task is to find these bridges and to make sense of how the micro relates to the macro. So, you know, what I've really done or what I've attempted to do rather is to sort of volunteer my life, my experiences, my timeline as, as a kind of case study to, to make sense of perhaps the formula that is utilized um, by, these, by these black operations to create, um, uh, uh, to create these, these conditions within, you know, people. And, and communities. So Broward County, um, we moved to Broward County when I was about 14 years old. We lived in Budapest, Hungary for a couple of years. And when I tell you that I was absolutely compelled, I had um, something of a meltdown, a breakdown, where I went to my parents and I begged and screamed and cried. And I said, we have got to move back to the continental US. I was actually, triggered by an episode of The Simpsons, okay, 14 years old. And I don't know how much uh, research uh, you, you've done into The Simpsons, but The Simpsons is a, is an enti is a popular um, tool of, of predictive programming that a lot of people have, have, have pointed out. Um, so I found that that was interesting. An episode of the, the Simpsons completely triggered me into this horrible meltdown where I said to my parents, we have got to leave Hungary, the country of Hungary, and we have got to go back to the United States. So we ended up in Broward County. So in a lot of ways, I, I don't know exactly how, um, I'm starting to learn about why, but I felt that I made us go to Broward because I had work to do there. I don't know if that was entirely I don't know if that was co-opted. I don't know if that was my higher self. Maybe it was a combination of all of the above. But what I can tell you is that from the ages of, of 14, okay, the, the drugging and the SSRIs had started 
well before that, which may have had something to do with the fact that I was triggered and I had a meltdown. I was not in my right mind, okay? It's very, very dangerous and unhealthy to give these young kids, 13 and 14 year old kids, antipsychotics, Geodon and Risperdal. It's insane, it's abuse. So we moved to Broward County. I was enrolled at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas in Parkland, Florida. We are one year and one day, one year and one day um, from the massacre that took place where 17 people were shot dead just last year at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. So, you know, it's all, it all feels like it led up to the shooting, okay? Um, I graduated, uh, well, I never graduated from that school, okay? I was a sophomore when I was, I voluntarily signed out of, of school there, and I was then sent to the boarding school um, in Blue Ridge, okay, which that boarding school has since been shut down. But from the moment that I arrived in Broward County, the, the, um, the therapy, the uh, observation from various doctors, I have to be very careful about revealing the names of these doctors as well as some of the names of the institutions because I, I think that they can sue me if they wanted to. So I, I do have to be careful. Um, but this, this is kind of what I'm getting at. The school shooter, okay, the alleged school shooter, uh, his name is Nicholas Cruz, who's a former student of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. And he was subjected to what I believe to be a more intensive, more sophisticated, more refined uh, blueprint of the assassin programming, uh, Manchurian candidate programming, as perpetuated by MK Ultra and the evil people who are responsible for that. And I believe that what I was, was a kind of test run, okay? They wanted to see what they could do. Um, and I don't think I was the only one. I think there's hundreds, thousands, okay? Um, but for whatever reason, I was made to come out on the other side of it with mind enough to articulate what I experienced. Now, Broward County is kind of the background, uh, I'm sorry, the backyard of the DNC, okay? Now, we don't have to get into partisan politics. It's neither right nor left. They're all corrupt. However, there is particularly uh, an entity within the DNC that has their talons or their tentacles right here in Broward County where they're very, very, very concerned with the port. So we have the Port of Everglades right here. And we also have um, the, uh, so we have the Port of Everglades. We also have the International Port of Miami, um, which if you were to zoom out on a map, Google Maps, you'll see that there is a perfect triangle formed from the heart of Miami all the way out to the other end of the Bermuda Triangle all the way down. So we really are in the heart of a vortex here. Now, a great many of your listeners know, I'm sure they know where I'm going with this, okay? It, it's not that hard to imagine how and why a very dark, nefarious entity within uh, the Democratic Party would have interest in a kind of port, okay? A kind of hub, if you will that is known for trafficking of all kinds, drugs, goods, people, children. This is what they do. Now, a few years ago, we had the big story of Pizzagate, also known as Pedogate breakout, which is where Wikipedia, I'm sorry, WikiLeaks released a lot of these, these emails um, that, that proved that there were um, all kinds of pedophilia taking place within the DNC. Okay, that was the first carrot that we needed to really just take us on a ride. And so the past two years has really been, if, if you take a look at QAnon, which it doesn't matter where you sit with that, okay? The information is the information. It doesn't matter if you are pro-Trump, against Trump, pro-Q, anti-Q, it doesn't matter. The information is the information. Our government, especially these, these, okay, so namely these nefarious entities within the government are extremely interested. If anything, their primary interest 
is in human trafficking. Now, I, I believe that Broward County, because of its uh, geographic uh, location, as well as what the ground is made up of, we have, we're the, great, the biggest filter in North America, maybe even the world, the Everglades, the swamp, um, it's very hard to navigate out there. It would be very easy for any of these uh, limitlessly funded groups to go out there and build whatever they want um, and utilize water. Now, this we get into some real woo-woo stuff here, but the significance of water as a means of interstellar travel is something that we are going to be learning a lot about, how water is more, con more conducive to travel to what we would call space travel than air or you know we've, we've all previously been fed the line that that outer space is this vacuous atmosphere where you're crushed and you can't breathe and you know while certainly i don't think we could survive out there i happen to believe that it's more of a plasmic uh viscosity where we where we could swim as opposed to float if that makes any sense so i do believe that these these deep black uh, projects are utilizing a the Bermuda Triangle, b the ports, c the very liberal um, uh, um, policies down here to get their hands in children uh, or on children down here uh, for 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 any number of things. You know, Nicholas Cruz, um, he, he was born to horrible you know a really unfortunate circumstance his mother was a drug addict father who even knows he was adopted his par his adopted parents you know there is there is death there surrounded by all of these conditions that really make it easy for what i call the white coats to come in and work on their candidate to work on their patsy and to activate or trigger him at a time when they needed it to happen so you know, it's a very unpopular opinion, especially where I where I live. People think that I'm advocating for Nicholas Cruz. I'm not. I wouldn't want to be alone in a room with the kid, okay? I'm just saying, uh, honestly, on behalf of the dead, on behalf of the people that were killed, that I think there are other people, lots of other people that are responsible for this and other mass shootings that we're not pointing our fingers at and we're trying to demonize guns and to change policies regarding guns that, you know when really that's not the problem the problem is mk ultra the problem are these these horrible uh deep factions that have all the funding that you can imagine and they know who to target they know what to do they're brilliant unfortunately they're brilliant and they're, they're way ahead of us technologically. So, you know, my task has really been to, to try to make sense of this. And even though it's been difficult to, to speak out about it because 17 people did die, including uh, a man that I knew, I did attend that high school and I knew Coach Aaron Feist well. You know, I, I'm friends with his little brother. I talk to him all the time. You know, people did die. So it, it is an unpopular opinion. To, to get up in front of people and say, well, listen, I know everybody is grief stricken and enraged about what happened, but there are horrible people that are in charge down here in Broward County that, that very much put lots of time and energy and money into creating scenarios and creating candidates, Manchurian candidates uh, with, you know, with which to carry out agenda. It's all just agenda and the end game ultimately is just about control. Um, the off-planet trafficking, um, for now, it remains to be a theory, although if anybody was to do a little bit of research, I actually have uh, a name here I'd like to draw. Um, people knew him as Bill. His name is William, William Powellick. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but he died uh, in May of 2007, but he was a, uh, a, co a computer operations and programming expert with the US Air Force who came out and said, there are entities within the government that not even the government as we know it is aware of that is making billions and billions of RFID chips that once these chips were created, the company goes under, the company goes away, never to be spoken about again. Where are the chips? 
where did they go? I theorize that these chips were implanted in billions of people that were then taken off world, but they can they continue to be monitored um, as well as the surface population is monitored with these chips uh, because there is an off world trafficking, massive interplanetary trafficking operation that is taking place right underneath our noses. And you get a lot of trouble for talking about this stuff. You're not supposed to talk about this stuff. You know, it's, a, it's an inconvenient subject matter. Um, but I just feel like it's so important and people are not going to be able to hide from it for much longer. Um, you know, QAnon, again, doesn't matter really how you feel about it. It's gotten people to, to ask questions. And so that's, you know, I, I give credit where credit is due. A lot of people are going to start talking about this stuff. And I do feel that one of the reasons I'm here perhaps is to help to assist in some way, whether that just be sharing my experiences or helping other people to realize their own experiences. Um, I don't know. All I know is that I'm never going to stop trying. <laughs> never. You'll never, they'll never be able to shut me. I shouldn't, I shouldn't test it, but uh, you know, as long as I can do this, I will. You're doing a fantastic job. <clears throat> Pardon the frog again. You mentioned the DNC. You mentioned the, the black ops that go on over there. I remember all the efforts at trying to minimize the whole concept of Pizzagate, of Pedogate. Oh, it's a distraction. And my, my response was always, if these emails go all the way up, at least as far as Hillary Clinton, how could it be a distraction? See, that that's trying to move the goalpost, trying to cloud the issue. Because some people, they got conspiracies on the brain, you know, pardon my Anunnaki in a way. And you throw out a concept like, oh, a psyop, a distraction. It's like their brain goes into meltdown and they can't see the forest for the trees. Pizzagate was key because it, it showed the connections of these sewer scum like Podesta and people like him and, and going all the way up to Hillary. So how could it be a distraction? The thing about the, the, the Democratic Party, they've always been both parties, as we know, because it's a duopoly, but they – have this domestic clamp down kind of gulag mentality more so uh, you look in the, the bill clinton administration you had all the the false flags and, and what have you of his era and now because these gulag types are are still around and there to try to create conditions quite frankly for a civil war and what people have to understand is We've always been under the War Powers Act for over a century, two centuries going on now. So that's the staging ground for all the stuff that happened. And then you create this endless war on terror, and then you bring that terrorism, so to speak, home with all these apparent domestic shootings and real domestic shootings like you talked about, which are all deep state, MK Ultra uh, uh, planned. But the end result is, and you can see some of this, you talked about the, the Simpsons earlier, uh, Jennifer, but in other TV shows like Stargate SG-1, for example, where Major Carter, she went into an alternate reality, and in that alternate reality, Earth was like in global police state mode because of alien manipulation. The powers that be, the military, everything was restricted. People were getting zapped by security forces in the streets, and it was all in the name of security all in the name of protecting us. So everything is an inversion when you look at it from that standpoint. And I'd like to make a quick point about the off-world trafficking, and I'd like your thoughts on this, uh, Jennifer. <clears throat> I know from my discussions with certain people that have had my lab experiences, we've established for some time now in the underground bases that there is this horrific human trafficking element going on. And Dulce, as horrific as that is, was just the tip of the iceberg. And Thank you, Thomas Costello, wherever you may be right now, for bringing out the horrors of Dulcie, Section D, Nightmare Hall, all the people being utilized in biological experiments and disappeared from the surface. But Dulcie is just a small part of a much larger pattern. We've spoken to people, I'm sure you've come across these, these types, Jennifer, where they describe horrific abuse in the underground bases. They describe humans being utilized in, in, in processing plants by reptilians. And they talk about human children in cages down there. And 
my female my labs have told me they've been gang raped by soldiers they've been gang raped by uh, scientific and, and technical engineering personnel in underground bases and in off-world settings and they'll even go to the trouble of cloning out uh, female my labs just to gang rape the, the the clone of the female my lab so that's kind of the backdrop to what you're talking about because for what we've been hearing sub rosa uh, jennifer the last several 10 15 years is there's definitely this off-world operation operations and they've accelerated and i think that that's part of the reason why the surface institutions of science and government what have you they're trying to throw their hat back into the ring and and, and try to stay relevant oh look we believe in aliens we believe that this big cigar-shaped rock thing that flew into the solar system that's really an et craft and almost every week now some Harvard astronomer or someone is talking positively about ETs because they want to stay ahead of that narrative. But what we need to tell people is, no, this is, that's just nonsense. This is what's been going on. Tell me your thoughts, uh, Jennifer, about how the activities in, in the swampy areas you've talked about in the past to me about like lights being seen out in, in the swamps and, and UFO activity, deep black military mm -hmm. activity perhaps, can you comment on that? Absolutely. <clears throat> so it is a known thing. There are locations out here. I'm sorry, it's so bright. The sun is at a really strange place in the sky. I didn't, didn't really plan for that. Um, there are locations out here. Um, like I said before, there's so many, um, the, the geography, the topography out here, it's, it's you can't just walk out there you know it's it's literally a swamp you've got snakes and gators and lizards and you just don't go out there um but people have reported lights in the sky um you know taking off from outwards upwards and outwards and then going back down uh into various canals and also into the swamp in locations that you you, you can't be there. you can't drive a car there you know unless there were these specialized vehicles that are designed to, to go out there they're they're semi-amphibious um but you know it's just they the, the federal government has uh lots of land out here you're not allowed to go there it belongs to them and so these are a lot of the locations that people report seeing these lights um and for, for me uh i i remember not even that long ago maybe four or five months ago i was headed down that way uh, right on the outskirts of Parkland. Parkland is right on the border of a uh, huge wildlife reserve. Miles and miles and miles, just expansive swamp land, okay? This immediately was something that occurred to me um, as being interesting around the time of the Parkland shooting. I was trying to put pieces together and I realized that this wildlife reserve, this federal land, um, was it was a point of interest, okay? We know that they utilize bases um, in mountains, underground, underwater, okay? Sometimes they're obvious places. Sometimes the best place to hide something is in plain sight. So uh, I, I, was, I was headed down there, and as I was driving in my car about to cross county lines, I just had this feeling that as I was going to be in Parkland, I was going to see something. I said, they're just going to make themselves known to me today. I don't know why I knew that. I was not particularly excited about it. There's no part of me feels that this is benevolent in any way. Rather, it felt like a, uh, we see you. We know that you see us, but we see you too. And sure enough, as I was driving down this road in Parkland, directly, it's only separated by a long canal. Um, and on the other side is this wildlife reserve, this federal land. Uh, I saw it. I saw this craft in the sky and it didn't follow any typical flight patterns of any kind of aircraft that I'm familiar with. Uh, it wasn't a bird and it just was kind of winking at me and, and letting me know, you know, I'm, we're here and we see you. And, you know, so these, these sort of things, you know, this area is just wild. Another thing I wanted to mention too Anybody could do their own research and find out that uh, there are cloning facilities here 
Um, one place in particular is called CloneAid. These are real, real facilities that have websites. They have web pages where you can learn about the cloning process. And if you have enough money, you know, they, they take it from the, it, you know, their, their website will present the scientific aspect of it and, and kind of the, their practical application of the cloning process is geared towards parents that want to, you know, learn more about their, you know, genetic ancestry and, and try to edit out certain diseases and things like that. And so they say, come on, welcome, welcome, come study, you know, let us study you, let us help you. When really, you know, there are certain celebrities, namely rappers for some reason in South Florida that are targeted by, uh, by these projects and will tell you point blank because they're freaking crazy. They've been you know, neuralized within an inch of their lives that they don't know. It, they're just telling you, they're being honest. They're not lying. They sound crazy and half of the people don't believe them because they're like, oh, Kodak Black is just crazy. Forget the fact that he entered uh, Broward County Jail and was there for four months. And when he exited Broward County Jail, he didn't have any tattoos on his face. All of his tattoos were gone. He looked like a different person. He was talking different. I mean, it is wild what happens to rappers in South Florida. There's another one. I don't remember his name, but I would love to follow up on it. He's saying, yeah, in my, my third generation clone was designed, created right here in Fort Lauderdale. People think he's joking, but I, he, I listen to him. And I hear him talk and I'm like, he's not lying. He's telling the truth. But people just think this is fairy tales. And it's like, you guys, they're telling us what's happening. So, you know, they, they really get away with a lot down here. Um, but that really has to do with the fact that for years now, uh, Broward County has been extremely corrupt. We have some of the worst leadership in, in the country. We have the likes of, we have the likes of Sheriff Scott Israel, who was recently uh, let go? He was recently fired from his position as sh as sheriff of Broward County. We have Debbie Wasserman Schultz, the one and only, just this one of the worst individuals. You just lay eyes on her, you're like, ew. We have Brenda Snipes. All of these people have repeatedly been implicated in corrupt voter voter fraud and all kinds of horrible things. But people, it just continues to perpetuate, and they're not voted out. They're not rid of because they're supported here by the judicial system, by the mental health system. They all work together here. It's a very sophisticated network of people that help each other out. They help each other, you know, continue with the corruption. So for some reason, and I believe that reason is, has a lot to do with the land, um, Broward County and, and the surrounding area, I think it has a lot to do with our ports the port of Everglades, you know, the, the port of Miami, these massive ships, it's the largest point, more imports and exports come out of South Florida than anywhere else in the country. You can't, and, and we all know that human trafficking is just such a booming industry. There's so much money. It's unthinkable how much money is in the human trafficking industry. And to think that that's not happening at the largest import export port in our country right here is ludicrous. Obviously it's happening, but they need their guys on the ground. The Debbie Wasserman Schultzes that, that have customs and border control in her back pocket. You know, just, just a few months ago, she had something like 25, 28 new agents that she handpicked to be border and customs control because they need people on the ground to say, okay, this, this is fine. Everything's fine over here. Forget the fact that it, there are children in that freight liner right now, you know, tied up and gagged and drugged, and we're going to make a couple billion off of, you know, the next year worth of import and export, you know? And then we have the Bermuda Triangle, which we, we know that they have interplanetary technology, interplanetary vehicles with which to get from this realm to another, how many people are they able to, to smuggle off world? Where, you know, the, the chips designed by Siemens, these RFID chips, 
where billions were made. And then as soon as they make their money and they make their product, the company goes away and it's never to be spoken of again. They implant these chips into people and they shuffle them off world. And it's all happening right here in my backyard. And I regret to say that, but you know, I just, maybe it's naive of me to, to feel this way, but I do feel hopeful. I feel like the work that we do here may have some kind of an effect. Me Again, maybe that's naive of me to feel that way, but I survived what I survived for a reason. I'm articulate and coherent for a reason, and I'm probably the only one down here that is out there kind of in these people's faces saying this stuff. So it's a dangerous place to be. Uh, I'm kind of surprised I'm not dead yet. Um, but I, I encourage everybody to take a sense of personal responsibility as where all of this is concerned because we can't wait. They want us to wait. They want us to lean on some kind of external source of uh, you know, whether it be religion or a group or something of that nature to, 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 to take on that leadership role. When I say, no, 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 each and every one of us has a responsibility to our children to unscrew this mess and to do what little we can, you know, it, it just has that domino effect. So I hope that that answers a little bit of, of your question. It does because the, the young are targeted and it's a cliche, but it's true. The, the, the children are the future. And the way they're getting hammered, even before they come out of the womb, and then what happens to them once they come out of the womb, and, and all the other aspects of this control grid that you talked about, a quick backdrop to the whole Bermuda Triangle ET connection, uh, the famous Herb Shermer case, patrolman Herb Shermer of Nebraska, 1968, taken on board a craft uh, by ETs. He was driving around in his patrol car and he was basically had an encounter where he was taken on board by these ETs. And these ETs told him, we have, we have an operation offshore of Florida, basically in the Bahamas, which is going to be very important for us and for the human race, right? And of course, you know, we don't understand the context of that statement. Is that kind of like a, you know, the serve man kind of context, like in, in the old Twilight Zone movie? You know, uh, this will be big for both humans and and, and us ETs, uh, you know, down, down the track, right? Well, he must have been referring to the activity off of Florida there in the Bahamas. And I, I alluded earlier to the Naval Undersea Research uh, Center down there, which is a cover for mega ET research and interactions going on. And also, of course, we have Puerto Rico, we have ET activity under sea base activity in and around Cuba. And we see that link. Haiti as well, the, the, the whole Haitian fiasco. Yes, that's right there in the Caribbean too. And the all the immigration uh, for, from the Caribbean and they've got it all going on there. So, uh, oh, before we end this first segment, that person you mentioned earlier, William Pollock, was that spelled P A W L E K? P A W E L E C. I think that might be the same guy. He was a he was a friend and colleague of Vance Davis way back when. In fact, if it's the same guy I'm thinking about, I met him in in Tennessee at a conference uh, back in the wow. day. And, and so, if it's the same guy, but he talked about stuff like this before, and I remember this guy had an ex Air Force background. Yeah. In the time we got left in, in the first segment, uh, Jenny, you're a multifaceted individual and you really take seriously all the different aspects of your work. C can you tell our listeners a bit about your, your tarot work? And also, please give us your website and, and your YouTube channel. Sure. Thank you. So my website is JennyMoonstone.com. By trade, I am a psychic intuitive and tarot reader. So it, basically, by living this way and by doing readings, um, this is my victory over, my, over what, I've, what I endured as, as a young child and, and throughout my teen years. My abilities, my impressions, although I didn't know that that's what that was because I was so misguided 
it was, they tried to drug it out of me. They tried to make it stop. They try, or maybe even they didn't want to make it stop. They wanted to control it. They wanted to see how it would change. They wanted to see how they could utilize it um, to, to, to some other benefit. So right now, the work that I do for people um, as a reader, this is me living my victory in a way where I can utilize my, my God-given abilities that creation you know, has, has imbued me with, um, and, and I can help people. So not because of what I've been through, but in spite of it. So they tried so hard to, you know, drug it away or make sense of it or misdirect it in some nefarious, impure, disgusting way that I didn't consent to. And as I got older and I left the, my family and I really just started to gain some, some life experience, I found a way um, to utilize my abilities to help people. So uh, I found tarot, uh, the, the art of tarot, um, when I was about 24 years old. Um, and when I tell you that divination, because that's one of the uses of tarot is divination, it is such a tool uh, w with which we can open up and unlock all of these windows and doors uh, of the mind and the psyche and, and the physical body as well, just the archetypes alone. Uh, I mean, we, we could talk for years and years about tarot and still really not scratch the surface. I'm certainly not, you know, I, I wouldn't call myself this master of tarot or anything like that because the truth is you never stop learning. There are so many, um, so many nuances. There's so many, um, so many facets of a single tarot card that we, we could take up, you know, just a week discussing one. But what I have found is that divination, uh, working with divination, working with the energy of, of a specific person, in my case, a client, we are able to mirror certain uh, aspects of their situation, any given situation, work situation, a relationship, uh, anything, your health, what tarot will do is it will mirror to us uh, in a way that, you know, it's totally neutral. Tarot doesn't care about our feelings. It doesn't care, you know, it, it's, it's, it's totally neutral. So it will show us things that we can see, things that we can't see. You know, it's just been this wonderful means with which to explore my own abilities and I've found this amazing template with which I, I'm able to read people. I can, I can really get a feel for their childhood, for, their, for the present time, for where they're going. So obviously every session is different because every client is different. And so I tailor each and every session uh, for, for the client. I've met hundreds of amazing people. James, when I tell you, that my life has become so enriched because I, I took a chance. You know, it's, it's a very, um, it, it was kind of hard for me to come out and say, listen, this is what I want to do professionally. This isn't, you know, I, I read cards for years before I took a red cent. Okay. I, I struggled. I cried. I said, I don't want to take money for this. This is, this is, uh, you know, this is something that should be God given and this should be free, right? Well, you know, you learn that your time is worth something, your energy is worth something. So um, when I did step out and say, listen, this is something that I would like to do professionally, the universe met me halfway. I put this much, the universe put this much, and I was just, I came into contact with people that really needed me at, at a time when perhaps nobody else or, or no other system such as tarot was going to do the trick. So I'm eternally grateful for tarot and, and for all of the, the, the clients that I've been blessed with to know. And I love what I do. It's my passion. You know, tarot has healed me in, in so many ways, just the, the symbols, the archetypes, the, 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 the astro, the astro theology, if you will. Um, so I, I would really love it if people were to 
uh, check it out for themselves. It's, you know, there's always something that you can learn. Um, and it really is for everybody. There's nobody that can say that, that tarot doesn't, couldn't mirror them. Oh, that's not for me. That's not my thing. It might not be something you're interested in, but tarot is a system that mirrors our own physiological systems, our nervous systems, our natal charts, how everything is in it. So, um, so please go ahead, check out my website. It's jennymoonstone.com and my YouTube channel is Jenny Constantine. So Constantine is my married name. Moonstone was kind of my business name when I first got started and it really stuck. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's how you can find me. Thanks for giving me the opportunity for that, James. I appreciate it. Oh, that's quite all right. And uh, before we end this first segment, which has been a barn burner, thank you so much for sharing, Jenny. Thanks. My I, pleasure. I had a tarot reading, an impromptu one in high school, uh, this gal I knew. And she just whipped him out one day and she started running these tarot cards on me. And I must say, that was my first exposure to tarot ever. And I was stunned and also a bit embarrassed because you pointed out how the tarot cards are neutral. And she was going bing, bing, bing about aspects of my, my personality and my character, you know, that I, that I was still coming to grips with, you know what I mean? I was like, God, that's how you know all this stuff, you know? Um, stop, right? <laughs> right. Um, but... You know, I, I wish I'd asked her at the time to you know, elaborate on it, but, you know, she just gave me a little quick demonstration. I go, wow. I mean, what she showed me was valid enough at that time that I didn't really need to see anymore. You know, I was convinced. And then she told me that she doesn't let anyone else touch her tarot cards because it's a very personal, energetic connection between her and her cards. And the, the cards in and of themselves seem to have a, 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 an innate sense of beingness the, the the cards themselves are are this conduit that connects this person to to higher forms of information and i saw it for myself it was pretty trippy actually well anyway we've reached the end of a fascinating first segment with our guest jennifer constantine uh, if you like what we do if we, you believe in what we do here at the cosmic switchboard show please go to our website thecosmicswitchboard.com sign up become a member and we'll see you at the top of the next segment